I think Steve said it so well that uh, we've come today needing this, wanting this. You know, it's just it's all week long. It's it's just this inside of all of us, whether, you know, we were directly affected by the fires or, you know, we've all been indirectly affected. And when you watch it on TV and you just feel it, you feel and you hear reports of people that you love. Could you turn me down just a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, please? Thanks. You just, it's just. It's just this overwhelming, this cry inside of us that we don't even know how to express it. And aren't you thankful for the gift of worship? Aren't you thankful that for, for us to be able to, in song, you know, share our feelings uh, that, you know, we have a God that, that really is great and he's got all this. And that, that we are no longer slaves to fear, that we've been set free from all that. So I want us to take just a moment and kind of center Take just a moment in, in, of silence and bring your, your heartfelt feelings before the Lord. God, we thank you for your presence. Right now, in this very moment, and all through this past week, your presence has been the very thing that gives us strength. Even in this, this time where we hear on the radio and the news that this is the uh, worst natural disaster in California history. Lord, um, it's just, it's heart-wrenching. And for those, Lord, that have been affected in so many ways, uh, whether being displaced from their homes, whether it's losing their homes, whether it's losing someone they love in this fire, or wondering, just they haven't heard from loved ones, just wondering what's happened. Lord, you are the one true, steady, constant. We need you, God. We always need you, but it's times like this that you bring to our mind that we really do need you, and we thank you for that, God. Help us, heal us today, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of, our, one of our purposes here, one of our goals is to bring hope. Because hope is essential to life. You know, you can live a few weeks without food. You can live a few days without water, a few minutes without air. But you really can't live without hope. That's what causes people to give up. And so we need to be reminded that today we, we really do have hope. Because I don't think too many of us have, have ever experienced a crisis of this magnitude. I mean, I, I remember in 1980 when Mount St. Helens erupted, we were in the path of the, of the, uh, the wind as it blew, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and I saw this black cloud coming, and everything turned pitch black, and then, you know, it began to rain ash, you know, two or three inches of ash all over the place, but yet... I didn't know anybody that lost their homes or lost their lives as a result of it. And, you know, in the, the um, Loma Prieta earthquake, you know, many of, of us may have been impacted, but it, it wasn't like this. Even 9-11 didn't, as, as shocking and jolting as that was, didn't impact our community personally the way that this fire has. Because the fires of this past week have really changed our city for decades this is not a, a sprint in the recovery of this. This is a marathon that, that we're going to be dealing with because much of my city, much of your city is gone. And people we love have lost everything. I, I talked with one of the pastors the other day and he was talking about his, his mother lived with him and, and she's in a wheelchair and they were taking her out the door and didn't have time to get a single thing out of their house. They barely escaped with their lives as ash, as the embers were falling on their home. It's like people have lost everything, physical. And for some of you, I don't, I don't even want to pretend that I can imagine what you must be going through with the, lo the sense of loss and trauma and fear slave to fear because fear is something that we have as human beings. I mean, you can't deny the fact that we face fear sometimes, but we don't have to be slaves to fear. Amen? Amen. And God has set us free, and, and we want to focus on truth this morning. Because when we face all this, we wonder, how are we going to respond? How can we have hope even in the worst of times? How can it happen? And there's one word, that's a, there's a one word answer to that question, and that one word is Jesus. 
Because only Jesus offers lasting hope. I know you would expect a preacher to say that. But I want us to see how true that is this morning. You see the, the title? I'm looking back there. You're here. The title that's behind us is Hope in Times of Crisis. We're going to be looking actually at a text in Mark 12. It's, it's really interesting. That's the text that was assigned to me. And this is one of the weeks I had my sermon already ahead of time. And this happened. And I started praying, okay, God, I, I can't preach that sermon I was going to preach. What do you want me to do? And he said, yeah, you got a different sermon I'm going to give you. But it's going to be out of the same text. And I opened the text up and I started reading. Have you ever done this? And all of a sudden, reading it through the eyes of what happened this, this past week, the fires, it's like God opened it up to me in a whole new way. And I'm gonna be, we're going to be studying out of Mark 12. By the way, I, we're going to have the scriptures up here. But if you want, I've printed up uh, a number of copies. It's back on the, of the scriptures I'm using. They're back on the, uh, at the connection point back there. But what we see in Mark 12, really, Jesus is in a situation Really, in a lot of ways, similar to ours because he is in the midst of crisis and conflict, which all of us can relate to on some level because Jesus' life was all about crisis and conflict, and it's reaching a climax at this point in time because what we really see is, is that Jesus' response to crisis and conflict give us hope. His very life gives us hope because in this text we're looking at this morning, it's about three days before Jesus is going to be crucified. And even as he faces the reality of the cross right in front of us, and Scripture tells us that he knew everything that was going to happen, even as that's right in front of him, he faces it with hope. That deep sense of expectation that everything is going to go well. Our text for today really begins with Jewish leaders, these religious Jews coming to Jesus trying to trap him because they, they hate Jesus and they want to try to humiliate him. And they ask him a series of questions that there's no answer to. It's kind of like the old question, I don't know, somebody said, have you stopped beating your wife? How do you answer that? Well, yes, I've stopped. Wait a minute, no, I never stopped. Well, no, I have. Well, no, that, it's like one of those kinds of things. If he answers yes... They get him if he answers. But there is no answer to these questions, but it's in the response of Jesus we see, wow, we have hope. I just want us to look at really one of those examples. We're not going to spend a lot of time in our text this morning because there's so many other things that we need to say. Hang on here for a second. Um, okay. I just want to look at one example with one of the questions they come to Jesus with. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians. By the way, these guys hated each other, but they band together to try to get Jesus. Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who we are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're kissing up to him, aren't they? trying to butter him up. Then they dropped the bomb on him. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now, here's the conundrum. Here's the trap. If Jesus says, well, yes, you should pay. See, the problem is the Jews hate the Romans. For good reason. The Romans are oppressing them. But not only that, their tax money goes to fund pagan temples. So if Jesus says yes, he's going to turn, he's going to offend all the crowds and they're going to reject him. So you say Jesus should say, no, no, don't pay the tax to Caesar. Then he's going to be in trouble with the Roman government and they'll run and tell the authorities. And so they've got Jesus. There's no answer to this question. And here's what Jesus says. But Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, knew their hypocrisy, why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and asked him, whose image, is, Jesus asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God's what's God's. And they were amazed at him. Now, I don't want, I, my point isn't to talk about taxes today. My point is to talk about the fact that really what we see in here is that, that Jesus 
has the answers to any question we have. And we'll talk about that in a second. But what really follows in this text is a series of questions that we won't look at one after another, after another, after another. There's no answer to it every time Jesus turns it around on them and makes them look like fools. And here's how this particular part of the text ends. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. No kidding, you know. So, here's what's sad about this, and here's how this relates to us today, and that is, Jesus came to them. They've been praying for the Messiah for hundreds of years to deliver them. Jesus comes and says, here I am, I've come to deliver you, and he offers them hope, and they missed the hope that Jesus had. I just find it so ironic. They're in the temple praying for the Messiah. Oh, God, send us the Messiah. Send us the Messiah. Meanwhile, he's out teaching in the courtyard. They come out and they try to trap him. And they go, man, we couldn't get him. They come back in. Lord, send us the Messiah. Send us the Messiah. And they totally miss it. And what Jesus sees in this, we don't want to make that same mistake. I know we're not here to try to trap Jesus, but we want to understand Jesus has hope for us. Jesus has the answers to all of our questions, even if we don't understand it. Even if we don't understand the answer, don't even understand the question. Because right now, Jesus, as he has the answers to every crisis we face, we can know that's why we have hope. We all have questions. Maybe, you know, through this week, here's just some of the questions we might have. And I've had some of these questions like, why, Lord? Why did this happen? Why did you allow this? Maybe some of you asked, did I do something to deserve this? Maybe you're wondering, God, where were you when my home was burning? Or why was it? This is always a mystery to me. Why one person and not another? Why was one home destroyed and the house next door to it wasn't? Maybe it was the Christian's home that was destroyed and the pagan's home that wasn't. Or vice versa. And I, it just, why? And like the Jews, we have a lot of questions. Certainly not for the same reason. We're not trying to trap God, but we wonder. And I've just got to tell you, you're probably never going to have the answers to those questions in this life at least to your satisfaction. But here's what's important. We know the one who does have the answers, don't we? There is someone who has the answers, and that's Jesus, just like he answered those Pharisees, boom, 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 with impossible questions. These aren't impossible questions for God. Sometimes I think he doesn't give us the answers because he wants us to trust him. Well, for one thing, if he gave us the answers, we're probably going, that, that, I don't get it. That doesn't make sense. God doesn't make himself accountable to us, but he also doesn't tell us because he wants us to trust him no matter what kind of fire we're in. And we all go through different kinds of fire. Maybe you face the literal fire like the one this weekend or this week. Or maybe you face the fire of cancer. Having your doctor say those words to you, you have cancer. Maybe you face the fire of having your spouse die suddenly in an accident. Maybe you face the fire of having a child that's disabled. Maybe you face the the fire of, of your career that you've spent decades in suddenly ending. And you have to start over there. Maybe you face the fire of your spouse saying, I want a divorce. It happens in our lives every single day. And that's where we have to trust him. We have to trust him in his promises that he makes to us. We trust him, for example, even if we don't understand it. Romans 8, 28. Most of us know this verse. In fact, I want, this is from the, the uh, uh, New American Standard. I want us to say this together. Can we do that? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want you to remember, notice again what it says. God causes all things. All things to work together for good. God causes what? All things things to work together for good. Now, I want you to notice it doesn't say all things are good. A fire this week that came through and devastated our community, and thousands of homes were burned to the ground, and who knows still how many people are, are dead in this. That's not a good thing. Any questions? But what God says is, I 
cause all things to work together for good. And God says, I I can't explain it to you. You're not capable of understanding if I try to, but believe me, I'm going to bring good out of it. And there's stories already emerging from all of this of good that's coming. Here's another one. Genesis chapter 50 says, uh, Joseph is speaking to his brothers, and he says, as for you, they sold him into slavery. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. I love that. What Satan intends for evil, God intends for what? Good. good. God, yeah, let's give God a, a hand on that one, okay? <laughs> then you can say, how are you going to do it, God? And I'm going to tell you, I don't know. It's really this. Do we trust him? Do we trust him even when he doesn't make sense? Because he has the answers, just like he did to the Pharisees. And because we trust him, we can have hope in times of crisis. Now, we're skipping over. I mean, obviously, I said I was going to do much more of a verse-by-verse study on this, but we're going to skip to one other story in this, in this text, and that's down in Mark chapter 12. After Jesus has been in the courtyard and the Pharisees and the religious Jews have been trying to hammer him, he goes into the temple and it says Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. I want you to notice just in there that says two couple words that we can easily miss. It says, Jesus watched this. Jesus was observing it. Jesus is watching us. Jesus sees and Jesus knows everything that you're experiencing. Whether you lost your home, or you got displaced from your home, or you're at home praying for people that you know who did, or you've lost loved ones in all of this. Jesus knows it. Jesus sees your tears. Jesus feels your pain. Jesus understands what you're going through. I love this passage from Psalms, where David says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. That's an interesting image that he says. He says, you you know my sorrows and you you collect all my tears in a bottle. This is a rather to us, it seems like a strange custom, but when someone would die in the Jewish culture, they had these little bottles and they would actually collect the tears that they shed for this person and keep them. Now, what he's saying is God... You have a bottle in heaven, and every tear I've ever shed, you've got in that bottle. You're aware of my pain. You're aware of my heartache. It's not like you're off here somewhere. You're right there grieving and crying with me. In fact, he tells us why, Hebrews 4.15, this high priest of ours. Who's our high priest? It's not Steve, no offense. It's Jesus. Steve's pretty close sometimes. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet without sin. Whatever you're going through, Jesus has faced it. Maybe his house didn't burn down, but he's experienced grief, I think far greater than we could ever imagine. In fact, And so because of that, I can pour my heart out to him and know he understands. But I want to take it even a step further. Not only does God see what we're going through, but God is with us in our pain. He's walking through the fire with us. Isaiah 43, verse 4 says, or beginning of verse 3, it says, When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, here's a metaphorical fire. Maybe for some of you it was a literal fire. You will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Verse 4, you are honored and I love you. Verse 5, do not be afraid for I am with you. 
You know, God's not over here, you know, standing back going, huh, man, come on, you can do this. I hope you make it. Guess where God is? He's walking with us, carrying us right through the fire. He's getting burned right along with us as we're feeling it. Wow. Can you imagine that, the creator of the universe walking through the fire with us? Years ago, there was a forest fire in uh, um, Yellowstone National Park. And, and the fire rangers were, wa- or the, the park rangers were walking through afterwards, surveying the damage. And one of them found on a stump, this bird perched there, just had been, was just standing there kind of, kind of just there. And it's like, that's really weird. It's just fried to a crisp. I thought, that is so weird and so eerie. And it just kind of creeped him out. And he took a stick to knock the bird down. And when he did, three little baby birds came scurrying out from under the mother's body. That mother had laid there in that fire protecting her babies. She went through the fire with them, and, and I think that's a great picture of God. So many times, I didn't include these scriptures, but so many times he talks about covering us with his wings and protecting us. He's there with us. Whatever you go through, if it's a, if it's a different kind of fire than this, because like I said, we're all going to experience them, experience different ones, he's with us. And that's why we say we can have hope in times of crisis. Now, the next section, one other thing I want us to notice in here, because we stopped a minute ago talking about the widow's might, calling his disciples to him. This is, I remember the widow comes in, drops in two little copper coins, but notice what Jesus says. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Now, I'm sure at this point, the disciples, as brilliant as they are, they immediately caught the point of Jesus. No, I think they probably were going, what's he talking about? This doesn't make sense. And so Jesus said, they gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. Wow, that's a different perspective, isn't it? God's perspective is so different than ours, isn't it? In every way. But I think what this says, as I put it at the bottom there, is don't discount the value of little things. This is a message for all of us, no matter how you've been affected by this, because every little effort can make a huge difference. Because we all want to help. I don't know about you, but I've just felt, anybody else feel this? It's like, I remember Monday, I was at home, and it's like, this isn't right. Anybody else feel like, I got to get out and do something to help? Yeah, I mean, it's like, come on, I mean, this is, and, and... Whatever it is, it makes a difference. If it's a phone call to say, hey, how are you doing? You okay? I'm praying for you. If you find someone that lost their home, just, you know, if it's giving them a hug and saying, I love you, not trying to fix them by saying, well, let me tell you some theological reasons. No, just hug them and love them. You guys know what I'm talking about. If it's making sandwiches for the firefighters, if it's opening up your home and letting people sleep on your couch, whatever it might be. God's perspective is not the same as ours, and he promises to bless every little action. And that gives all of us hope in the midst of crisis. Here's the thing, friends. We live in a broken world, filled with conflict, but so did Jesus. He experienced that conflict and that crisis, and so will we, because evil is for real. And see, we live in an illusion that we can be safe and secure in this world. But we realize real quickly, after 9-11, after this happened, especially here in the wine country where we have this idea that, you know, life is good and life is secure and, you know, we're okay and, you know. Truth is, there's no security and no hope in this world. I was listening to the radio just, um, I think it was Monday, right after this happened. The fires come and became public and everything. And the radio announcer, God bless him. I mean, I'm sure he didn't intend it to come across this way, but he made a statement. We want to get these, get, get these fires, you know, contained so we can get back to the life as we enjoy it here in Sonoma County. I thought, really? 
Really, that's it. Get back to your, you're thinking, you know, let me get back to my wine sipping and my food pairing. And I mean, nothing wrong with those things. But is that what you're thinking about when people's homes are burning to the ground? I mean, I, I'm not, I, maybe I'm judging the guy. I don't know what he meant by that, but I just, there's, it's an illusion. We cannot put our hope in this world. It's a false, it's a false security hanging by a fragile thread. I mean, this isn't totally true, but on Sunday, my biggest concern was, you know, my Netflix, Netflix queue, you know, make sure I got the next movie in the right spot, you know, because I don't want to get, that changed real quick. It changed real quick for some of us as you were running from your homes. Some people deny it. Some people try to control it. I can make my world safe. I remember after the tsunami happened you know, a little over 10 years ago, I was in an airport and there was a woman that was there and we were just talking about it. She said, well, the earth is offended with us and the earth is striking back. Okay, that's one perspective. The reality is the earth is not angry with us. It's not offended. The earth is fallen and it's crying for redemption. And we can't stop evil by being nice. We can't stop evil by stockpiling up on ammo. We can't stop evil by whatever else it is. The truth is, there's no hope in this world. In this world, there's only hope in Jesus. Look at this passage in John chapter 6. Jesus had all of his followers were deserting him. Thousands of people because Jesus was just cutting right through it, speaking right, but speaking the truth, and they deserted him. Jesus turns to his disciples and says, are you two going to leave me? And, and, And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And the question I would ask you today is this. If not Jesus, then what? Where are you going to find hope? You go, I'm going to find hope in my my possessions, physical possessions. Boom, they're gone in a fire. I'm going to find hope in the government. Okay, I'll let you do that. (laughs) I'm going to find hope in my job. I'm going to find hope in a relationship with another person. I'm going to find hope. I'm just going to tell you something. If not Jesus, then what? He is the only one who gives hope. And I'm just going to tell you, if you came in this morning looking for answers, thinking, you know, okay, Barney's preaching, he's going to answer all our questions. You know what? I don't have answers. But I know who does. Jesus Christ. And he is the ultimate answer because he's our hope. He's our rock. Psalm 62, David cries out, I find rest in God. Only he can save me. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defender. I will not be defeated. I find rest in God. Only He gives me hope. You know, it's interesting, just not yet Warren, but a little bit, I'm, a few minutes I'm going to call Warren up here, but Warren and Becky Hayes, and I know so many of us know them and love them. Warren was on staff here for so many years, and Served as an elder, and he spoke just a few, preached just a few months ago here, but Warren and Becky's house burned to the ground. And I saw a picture of this on Facebook. All that's left of their house is a rock chimney with a metal cross attached to it. Jesus is our rock. I think that's a message for Warren and Becky, and it's a message for all of us as well, because at the end of the day, after all the fires are finally put out, he's all we've got. But that's okay if we're standing on that rock. I remember a time, um, and I've shared this uh, with, with a little bit, a part of this story, and I, I'm not let me just, I'll just go and tell the story. I'm not saying this at all to, to say I have been in the same situation as somebody's house burned down, but back a few years ago, we lost our home. Bad investments and so forth, and, you know, our home was foreclosed on. And I remember when that happened, I had a lawyer that called and said, you need to declare, or not a lawyer, a financial advisor, you need to declare bankruptcy. And I'm sitting in my garden where I went and met with God, and I'm praying to God, and in a state of despair, realizing 
This was our retirement. Everything I was counting on. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars we're about to lose or we have lost. And I remember just God speaking to my heart. He said, that's not your house. You don't own anything. And I can't tell you the peace that came over me sitting in that garden, having lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was my retirement. Now i got to work at crossing the Jordan. No, God bless it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do anything else. Where's Dana? Oh, oh I'm in trouble. I, I, I didn't mean it. I was teasing. Now, okay. But I, 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 that destroyed my point. Okay. I'm sitting, in that, I'm sitting in my garden praying, and I just can't describe to you the peace that came over me knowing I own nothing. And I'm not saying my situation is, yeah, I know what Warren and Becky are going through. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I got just a tiny little taste of knowing the peace that we can have from knowing all we have is Jesus. Because God is all we need. And he brings healing out of the loss. Look at this passage, Isaiah 61. They were about to go into captivity where they were going to lose everything. And God writes to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. I love that phrase, he will bring beauty out of ashes. Whatever your fire is, it's going to happen. We can have hope in times of crisis because we're standing on the rock. Now maybe you're wondering this morning, how can I find that kind of hope? I'll just tell you how, just ask. Ask Jesus for it. Just say, God, I, Jesus, I believe in you. And if you've never done this, invite him to come into your heart. Take control of your life. Let him have it. And he'll begin to set you on the path of receiving peace. Warren, would you come up, please, in your entourage here that's with you today? You know, I mentioned earlier that Warren uh, and Becky lost everything in the fire. And there's a beautiful, it was a beautiful expression in our first service. Brought, God brought Tane, Mites, Tane and Pamela and their family who lost everything. And Tane was able to pray. And I, I talked to Warren last night and said, Warren, would you come and pray for us this morning? Because I'm going to tell you something. Warren can pray with authority. As someone who's lost everything he has in this fire, he's, I'm sure, going to share a couple things. He's got some friends. He'll talk about that. And Warren, go ahead. Brother. Thanks, Mark. Was that a good sermon or what? Is, yeah. Huh? Um, I, uh, some of you know that I'm the, the uh, director for the Law Enforcement Chaplaincy Service in Sonoma County. I've been doing it for 18 years. And the reason the... Uh, the organization is so successful is because of people like these and I just want to honor them um, and where were you this morning vets memorial building so they've been serving our community along with other chaplains and I want to introduce Brianne Crespin who is our senior chaplain and what that means is I get to rest and be important and she does all the work, and she is so efficient and such a wonderful administrator, and she supports me, and she called me the night of the fire four times to get my butt out of bed because I didn't believe that my house was going to burn, and I didn't believe it was that serious. And uh, Brianne's husband is a law enforcement officer for Santa Rosa Police Department, and uh, I guess he had called her and said, you know, call Warren, there's a problem, there's a fire. And she said, you know, Santa Rosa is on fire, and I just was in disbelief. And she called four times, and we finally got out of that house, and we had to leave everything there. Um, and I can't, I can't even tell Brianne and John how much I appreciate them. Um, we have become like this, and we don't go to the same church. What do you think God is doing through all of this? This is Zeke and Aida Ortiz, and they are uh, law enforcement chaplains, and Zeke's father was a Pentecostal minister, and Zeke is raised in the Pentecostal church. 
and we have been drawn together as one. What do you think God is doing in the church today? And um, I just, I, I am so grateful for the unity. Unity is happening. Unity. God didn't send the fire. He sent the fire years ago for our benefit. Fire is good. It's our misuse of it that's a problem. It's our greed that's a problem. See, this is going to happen because I just listened to you preach, and we're brothers, and I'm going to get going. And I'm just going to pray, and what we do, we'll be... No, no, I don't you want... do it, man. You do what you need um, to say. But what a beautiful thing that's happening. You know, people are saying, well, Jesus is coming back. Yeah, but not now, because he wants this. Not yet, because he wants this. He came back already. Did you notice? He died and he was resurrected. He came back and he's here. He's here. What we long for has happened. We are one body and he will use everything that happens to bring us into the reality of what is already so and that's the unity of believers on the earth because we are the salt and the light. Jesus, don't come back yet. This is my closing prayer. Don't come back yet, please. We want to experience full unification in the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters walking together, Protestant, Catholic, denominations, all believers walking together as one on this earth and bringing salt and light and healing. Don't come back just yet. Isn't that what you want? Amen. Isn't that what we all want? And so my prayer, Father, for us, I would give a hundred houses. And I'm not a hero. But I would give a hundred burning buildings that I own to have what you desire on the earth. And I thank you, Lord, even in the suffering of life because you are there because your son suffered more than any of us and he knows and he understands and he walks before us with empathy and compassion and he cares deeply for all of us so lord we thank you for even the suffering in life we thank you that we can walk through the fire and come out unscathed. We thank you that we can walk through the trials of life and you've promised to use them for good. So we bless you. May we rise up, rise up from the ashes as it has been spoken here today. May we stand firm in our unity with one another. When Jesus spoke to the church at Ephesus in Revelation, said you've left your first love. Anybody can say they love Jesus, but First love is our love for one another. There is no love of Jesus without love for his people. May we finally get it. Mm. And may we return to our first love, and that is loving Christ through others and, and loving them and loving Jesus by loving one another. May it be so. May it, may it come to pass in your precious name. I thank you for everyone here today and the blessing that they are, the power of their life. Fill us, Holy Spirit, afresh as we partake of communion and we, we go from this place. May we go out and make a difference for people and be that salt and light. A city set on a hill. In Jesus, amen. I love you, man. You know, as Warren mentioned, um, Jesus suffered more than any of us could ever suffer. And just as Warren had the authority to pray there, Jesus has the authority to speak into our suffering. And we have a very tangible way that we get to participate in the suffering of Jesus right now. And that's through the communion. We're going we're gonna to have, if we could have the ushers go ahead and prepare the communion, get ready to serve. We, uh, we're going to join in that where we find not just an event that happened 2,000 years ago, but it's really all about a person. It's about Jesus. 
so that even in the worst of times, Jesus is saying through the cross, I give you hope.